All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started, and then uh, they'll probably be bringing lunch in through here, so we'll really distract you and make you smell food, so I'm sure it'll be, sure it'll be good. Uh, this topic's going to look at uh, the weather and climate conditions that you typically see in Nebraska through your grazing season, and also uh, go into a little bit about soil temperature. Uh, my background is in uh, meteorology and climatology, and then also some agronomy, so we'll kind of tie in both pieces here and... Uh, Look at things that you may already know. Um, everyone kind of knows what Nebraska weather does. You, you never really know what Nebraska weather is going to do. But what I notice is a lot of times we become uh, pretty recent in, you know, the, the trends that we see. You know, if we have two dry years, we forget about that there actually are, you know, wet years that come around. So we'll look at some of the, the climate data, to, you know, what the averages are around the area, and give you a little bit of idea of maybe why things happen and why they don't. Uh, this is a picture I threw together because this is how I visually look at Nebraska weather. Um, you know, we're in the middle, we're a long ways from water, so our weather is very extreme. Okay, that, that water kind of acts as a, a buffer to our weather system, and we're a long ways from that. And then these Rocky Mountains also create a lot of extreme weather and decrease the forecasting ability. So. As you get closer to the East Coast, you know, the predictability gets a little bit easier. The, you know, the weather extremes get a little bit narrower. You know, we can go from 80 to 20 in a day. We know that, right? That happens <clears throat> frequently. It happens every year. And that's kind of unlike a lot of other places in the U.S. And it happens right in just the east side of the Rockies. So this is kind of how I visualize what we're going up against here in Nebraska. So some of the climate averages. Uh, top left map is the annual precipitation. Uh, it's of the High Plains region. And you can see it's evenly distributed. About every 100 miles, we drop about 5 inches in precipitation, you know, average throughout the year. And the black line is the 100th meridian, which is, you know, west of the 100th meridian, you can't grow corn, right, without irrigation. It's about right at that 23 inches of annual precipitation. You know, so it's, it becomes very difficult. We get west of there. In the last couple of years, even 200 miles east of that 100th meridian, we still couldn't grow corn without, you know, some irrigation. So, <clears throat> so this is kind of the the 30-year average, um, right about 20 to 25 inches, you know, give or take. Obviously, every year that changes. So the temperature, you see a north to south gradient. Okay? We kind of know the closer to the south you are, the warmer it is, and it increases to the north. You know, our, our average temperature is about 50 to 52 degrees average throughout the year um, and it changes from north to south so if we overlay these two I couldn't figure out how to overlay two maps and get them to show or else it would have looked really cool so we're just going to talk about it but you get a number of different quadrants right we know that you know we're getting a quadrant up here with less rain cooler temperatures compared to down here more rain warmer temperatures right so we get quite a you know variability there you know and they say that the weather changes more from west to east Nebraska than it does from eastern Nebraska to the east coast. So um, we get a lot of variation here, which we do lots of things like research. We, uh, we get some uh, pretty cool stuff. So anyway, so that's kind of our, our annually what we're looking at. But if we start in October, you know, our typical grazing season, you know, I looked at October to March. You know, it, that varies obviously every year and with different operations. But you can see our precipitation that we get, you know, inch and a half to two inches is about all that we're going to get in October. Um, some years more, some years less. But snowfall is pretty minimal. You know, a lot of that is going to come in rain. Uh, we do get occasional snow events, but it doesn't happen every year. So most of that precipitation, that inch and a half to two, is going to come in the form of rain. So we look at the temperatures. We start the average high temperature we get in October is, uh, you know, 62 to 64 uh, throughout the month. We know the beginning of the month is warmer, end of the month is cooler. Um, and then we start to look at the, the minimum temperature. We can see that we start northwest to southeast. We get warmer as we go from, you know, Shadron to Beatrice. Okay, so we kind of get that early winter setup where the cold air starts pushing in from this way. Our highs are still pretty flat, okay? So we, you know, warm as we go south, but we also warm as we go south and east as far as uh, minimum temperatures. And you'll notice a shift in that as we go through the winter. Uh, November precipitation, we start to get quite a bit less, you know, less than an inch for most of Nebraska. Snowfall, it's most all of it comes in the form of snow, you know, three to six inches of snow. Uh, so that's not too much uh, moisture in there. 
maximum temperatures we start getting down into the low 50s for highs and minimum temperatures we're now dropping below freezing especially in the northwest part of the state and even into the southeast part of the state we start getting freezing temperatures so we can expect these freezing temperatures our soils are going to start cooling down as well December uh, even less precipitation pretty much everything is in the form of snow maximum temperature uh, we can see the southwest part of the state is now warmer than the northeast so we no longer have that flat um, you know lateral gradient as far as temperature so now we're starting to increase from north uh, or start to decrease from the southwest to the northeast so our our pattern shifts a little bit we get into this winter time pattern that we've been seeing here for the last three months where this over the great lakes region we get this low pressure system cold air and so northeast nebraska can be quite a bit cooler than the southwest but the minimum temperature we still drop off quite a bit more in the northwest part of the state. So we're starting to see that, that extreme changes just in Nebraska as far as uh, compared to these, comparing the western Nebraska to eastern Nebraska. January, um, again, we're about half inch of precipitation for most parts of the state. It's all snow. We still get this temperature, warmer temperatures out west compared to the east and southeast. And our minimum temperature kind of steadies out a little bit across the state. February, Again, less than half inch precipitation, it's all snow, warm temperatures. We're starting to get up into the 40s for our maximum temperature. We're not going to get even close to that today. And I'll have a map later showing actually that we are quite a bit behind as far as temperature, but that's nothing new, right? We know that. But our average daily high is over 40 degrees. You just might not know that looking outside. Uh, daily lows, we're still getting down into the lower teens. March, our precipitation starts to pick back up, we get into the rainy season, inch and a half to two inches of precipitation. Most of it's going to come in rain. We do get them snow events that are pretty heavy, uh, where they're, uh, you know, 10 to 1 ratios, even maybe lower as far as the snow to liquid water. Uh, maximum temperature, we get up into the 50s for daily highs and still below freezing for lows. So all of that is coming down into soil temperature, you know. We know that the air temperature, moisture, things like that, affect how our soil temperature is going to uh, what it's going to look like and I talk about this a little bit because we know that compaction is an issue with grazing and if we can you know freeze and thaw those soil temperatures we can alleviate that compaction at, you know above that four inch level or when is it going to be frozen for all year long you know when can we graze on frozen soil and not have to worry about that compaction so that's why we jump into the soil temperature and I show you this as to show the complexity of soil temperature. You know, there are a number of different equations that are going into calculating soil temperature. These are just a few. There are a number of different ones, and Umberto can solve these for you afterwards if you want. This is right up his alley. So, uh, and take soil physics in the fall. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to take soil physics in the fall, go for it. I'm going to pass. <laughs> so I put those up there for, like I said, two reasons. One, to show you the complexity. And number two, to make you think that I actually know what's going on in these. I don't. <laughs> you know, uh, obviously we know that different soils conduct heat differently. Moisture affects that. So all of this, we're just going to know that soil cover, soil moisture, soil type, you know, all those soil properties alter the soil temperature, right? That's kind of what we're just going to take into right now. We're not going to solve these. We can go back to college, but we're not going to. So if you want to find soil temperature data, um, you can go to... It's hard to see, but it's cropwatch.unl.edu. Go to that website, hold your mouse over the weather tab, and go down and click on soil temperature maps and data. And that'll bring up soil maps like that. This, I, I think, is from uh, November sometime. But it'll bring up two maps that uh, we'll look at uh, most recent data here in a little bit. Two maps showing you the seven day average and the departure from normal, and then each individual station will have um, the soil temperature. So uh, there's a lot of data in there, a lot of usefulness to it. And uh, we'll go into more depth as far as these soil temperatures and how they're found. But uh, they come from these AWDN stations. They, they take the soil temperature from bare soil. So you can see these little bare soil spots. And it's at 10 centimeters. So about four inches of depth is where they measure the soil temperature. And they come to get those maps, like I showed before, they come from all these stations in Nebraska. They're scattered throughout, but you'll notice there's, you know, long ways from Lexington up to Broken Bow or wherever that is. That might be Broken Bow. 
But anyway, so you, so you see there's some distance there, right? And we know that the soil temperature can change a lot across those distances. So it's meant to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So what I did is I took a number of stations and I just plotted the soil temperature data from October 1 to March 31st at from the data from in Lexington 1986 to 2012. So about 25 years worth of soil temperature data and I also plotted in here air temperature data. And I should have warned you at the beginning if you don't like graphs and charts you might just close your eyes because we're going to get a lot of these. Um, what we have, the top one up here is, uh, they're kind of intertwined. What we have is your average high temperature for the station and also the soil temperature maximum for that day. So I'll explain that. On October 1st, the soil temperature maximum for 25 years was just under 70 degrees, was the maximum temperature in those 25 years. And it's also pretty similar to the average high temp daily high temperature for that time of year. So it, kind of falls that, but the main thing we're looking at here is this purple line that's hard to follow through here because there's way too much, and that is the average soil temperature. So we can see the average soil temperature and uh, for all 25 of those years on October 1st at four inches was about 60 degrees. Okay, so that's kind of on average where we're gonna start at in October. So we'll drop pretty you know, linearly with our temperature, but we get below freezing around the middle of December stay below freezing through all oh, the middle of February. So we know that that there are probably going to be some frozen soils in between then, right? If our average is there, we know that it's not always going to be below that, we know it's not always going to be above that, but there's some confidence that we can put our cows out on our fields and be on frozen soil this time of year. Uh, you can see down here I have the precipitation for this plot. Uh, you know, we don't get a whole lot of precipitation, so soil moisture might not be as big an issue. Um, as we get into the spring, it starts to thaw back out, then you can be a little bit more concerned about, you know, the moisture in the ground. There's probably not a whole lot of moisture out there right now. Um, we have had some snow, but I'm guessing there's probably not much there. But you'll see the minimum, temp or the minimum soil temperature, we get some crazy numbers here, and most of them don't look like that. But you can see the minimum soil temperature does get down pretty low, but it doesn't get as low as this red line, which is the average minimum daily temperature, air temperature. So long story short, the soil temperature is kind of buffered in between the, the air temperature, right? It takes you know slower to cool down, slower to warm back up. So we're kind of in between those zones. So we're just going to flip through a few different sites here. The Holdridge site, see this orange line again is our average soil temperature. We drop below freezing uh, middle of December again and come back up beginning of February. So again, most of this time we're below freezing as far as at the four inch level. That the two inch level will be quite a bit different, you know, it'll be more extreme than this. And then we'll just compare that to the Holdridge 4 North, which is four miles north of Holdridge. The Holdridge weather station is seven miles south. So we're going to get a little bit different data, but there's only about, you know, 10 miles difference in that. But you can see this uh, average soil temperature here doesn't actually get below freezing on average. And we saw that the one at the Holdridge station that was seven miles south of town did get below freezing. And so what's going on that this temperature is not as cold as the one south of there? Um, so we can look at the precipitation and the temperature data for the Holdridge and Holdridge uh, four north weather stations. The one that's north of Holdridge gets about an inch, a little over an inch, almost an inch and a half more precipitation a year on average than the one south of town. So the more soil moisture there, it's going to be more of a buffer for that soil temperature, so it won't cool off quite as much. And then also the air temperature. The air temperature south of Holdridge is warmer, but it also cools off more at night. And so again, compared to the Holdridge 4 North. So this is to illustrate the differences just in your climate and weather systems within 10 miles in Nebraska. So finding one of these stations isn't gonna tell you what's happening exactly in your field. It gives you an idea, but again, there's so many different variables at play, like location, soil type, things like that, that can make a big difference. So if we look at McCook, in the southwest part of the state, a little bit warmer climate. Uh, we know it warms up earlier uh, in, the, or in the spring, as compared to the northeast. 
and we can see we the black line is our average soil temperature stays right around that freezing mark. So we're, uh, again, just a little bit warmer than what we were at Lexington and even in Holdridge. So if we look at Arthur, Arthur is north of Ogallala, up in the sand hills. The soil type here is sand. All the other soil types have been uh, silt or silt loam. This one's sand, so we're getting more extreme temperature. We can get quite a bit cooler here. It does get the daily air temperature is cooler, so that does make a difference, but that sand will allow that warming and cooling to happen faster. So we see it gets uh, it freezes from all the way from December to March. So it's uh, the average temperature is below freezing quite a bit longer there. Sydney, uh, the top, you know, like foot and a half is silt, and then underneath that was sand. At this station, uh, we are below freezing for a month and a half there. Uh, we get quite a bit less precipitation here in Sydney than we do in this part of the area, but similar trend, right? We know December 15th to February 15th, most of it's going to be frozen. North Platte, we're getting similar, similar numbers there, similar trend. Again, there's lots of data and numbers that goes into this, but you're seeing the idea. Then I just threw in a Northeast Nebraska one to, to compare. See that the blue line is the average temperature. We see there the average high temperature, and you can see that that drops down quite a bit. Right? They're, they're 10 degrees cooler a lot of times this time of year than we are. So uh, that'll make a big difference in their soil temperature. So this is the data from that CropWatch website from December. You can see it December, it's hard to read, I'll read it for you. The pink there is 26 degrees. Okay, the seven day average is 26 degrees. And compared to normal, that was five to six degrees cooler than normal. So normally this time of the year, we're right at the freezing mark. This year, we were five to six degrees below that. So it, it changes quite a bit from year to year. And these maps help you to look at where you're at from normal. So today's soil temperature, actually it was yesterday's soil temperature because I didn't pull it off today. But we're about right at freezing here in Gosper County where it's 32 to 32 and a half degrees at that four inch level. And I think it's, you know, negative what, two degrees or something this morning or five degrees, whatever it was. And our soil temperature at four, four centimeters or 10 centimeters is still not freezing. That seems kind of hard to imagine in my mind that the soil temperature is still that warm. But again, these are from bare soil plots. Uh, they don't have any residue cover on them at all, so they can warm up pretty fast. You know, last week we had some pretty warm weather. And even the last two weeks we had some decent weather, so it can warm up quite a bit. And we're still probably two degrees below normal. This is our uh, departure from normal. So we're about two degrees cooler than normal, even at that 32 degrees right there. So it again the temperatures the soil temperatures don't get as cold as we think. This was uh, there's a neb guide out there called uh, soil temperature for planting uh, agronomic and horticulture crops. Just so some show some pretty cool uh, graphs as far as soil temperature. Um, it shows what time of the year in the state does the soil get to 40 degrees. Our area is you know the March 10th or so, kind of right on that line. So around March 10th, we might get up to 40 degrees, our soil temperature. And uh, you know, as you move forward, and you know, when does it get to 45 degrees? It's towards the end of March. When does it get to 50 degrees? We're at the beginning of April. Uh, we know, you know, the corn can start being, you know, corn needs temperatures above 50 degrees to grow. So we can tell after, you know, the first week of April, our soil temperatures more than likely are going to be above that 50 degree mark. And then it goes on into when does it hit 70 degrees. And you can see different parts of the state warm up faster than others based off the climate, based off their soil type. This next one went into the variability. How did 2000 to 2009, that decade, compare to the decade before? And what this says is that by the time we hit 40 degrees in our area, it was a week later in the 2000 to 2009 decade compared to the 1990 to 99 decade. Okay, it's hard to imagine that, but it came a week later on average. And we hit 50 degrees, again, we're kind of about, about a week later again. But when we got to 55, now we're all of a sudden we're a week to maybe two weeks earlier. So it, was, it warmed up faster. You know, it didn't warm up quite right away, but then when it hit, it warmed up faster. Why, I don't know. This is just what the numbers are showing. I'm guessing the next decade will look different. 
But if you want more information on maps, it goes through how this affects planning dates, um, varieties, things like that. You can search for this uh, NEB guide online. And if you're really good at memory, you can remember that link. So review, uh, we talked quite a bit about the variable weather conditions in Nebraska. Uh, they change year to year, day to day, but there is some predictability. Uh, the soil temperatures will vary from field to field, uh, from the surface cover that you have, the soil type, moisture, and your location. But the cold winters in Nebraska, we, it gives us some confidence that there's going to be a freezing and thawing. You know, that freezing and thawing is going to happen. Uh, sometimes it's even solid frozen when we're out there grazing. So we know that that freezing and thawing can limit the compaction that those, uh, those cattle might have on that cornfield. You know, if we can freeze and thaw down to five inches, that'll break up that compaction because the hoof compaction is probably only go down to, you know, five to six inches. There will be a talk later that will go more into depth on the compaction. These are just looking at the, the temperature. And then there are also tools that, you, that can help you when you're out there grazing. What tools can you use to be better prepared, know when to take the cattle off, maybe to, to look ahead a little bit. So some of the climate and weather tools that, that I use, uh, Climate Prediction Center, uh, the High Plains Regional Climate Center, Drought Mitigation Center. There's also a project called AgriTools that we're working on that will kind of collaborate all of this data together, uh, bring it to you in one place. So you're not having to search all over the, the web for it. So the Climate Prediction Center puts out this eight to 14 day outlook. This is yesterday's. It's actually still current because they don't come out the new one until this afternoon. You can see that in eight to 14 days they're expecting below normal conditions for this region, the eastern two thirds of the US. The western third is gonna be above normal. And that's all that's telling you. It's not saying it's gonna be you know, below freezing. It's not gonna be 10 below. All it's saying is there's a, looks like here there's a 90% chance that it'll be below normal temperatures. So that's pretty high. If you see something like that, it's almost, almost like they're guaranteeing that it's going to be below normal. So for 14 days, expect below normal conditions. No, you're not excited for that. I'm not anyway, I like spring too much. But tools like these can help you look out in, into the future about maybe when you need to take your cattle off. If it's below normal temperatures, we know that soil is probably going to stay frozen for another couple weeks, right? So if we're worried about the thaw going out, um, getting too deep of hoof prints in the ground, we can use these tools like these to look ahead and be like, you know, I might be pretty safe for another two weeks. Might just leave them out there. If this was above normal, you know, at 90% above normal, we might say, I need to get those things off because that freeze is coming out. And then it goes over precipitation. If it's your uh, below normal precipitation above, or if you have an equal chance of normal conditions. This is the one month outlook. Again, for March, they're saying below normal in this part of the region, above normal temperatures in that part of the region. And then they do a three month outlook. Again, nothing's really changing too much and it's not that exciting because I like to see warm weather. The Drought Mitigation Center has tools that you can use. They put out the drought monitor. They have a drought impact reporter. And they also have a current veg dry, which is a tool that looks at how dry the vegetation is uh, there's not much going on right now. You can see out in California where they do grow stuff this time of year, it's pretty dry. But in the summertime, you'll be able to see colors and you can see almost right down to the area where the, dry, uh, where the crops are dried out at. So um, this may not be a lot of help for you as far as changing your practices, but you know that marketers are looking at that, crop insurance companies are looking at you know, things like that, seeing where the drought is and how bad it is. The High Plains Regional Climate Center can get you maps like this. Any map that you want to know, this is uh, the last 30 days, our departure from normal temperature. So we are about eight to 10 degrees below normal right now for our average temperature over the last 30 days. Again, that's nothing new, I'm not telling you rocket science, but you can look at two weeks, six months, rainfall, anything you want as far as a, a map, this place will have it. And then they also have soil moisture data. You can look, see what the soil moisture is doing throughout the last year. When it goes up, you can usually see when the big rainfall events are, a few things like that. So anyway, that's climate and weather for our area and a little bit of soil temperature.